There are so many stories I could tell you about my very, very dear friend, Val Weiss. Like how she built a wonderful school into a much more wonderful school in Washington, D.C. A world-class, absolutely fully implemented Montessori school in an area of Washington, D.C. where it's been challenging to build such schools. I've watched her over the years become a new head of school and a student in the Montessori Leadership Institute. I've watched her determine that she wanted to understand Montessori at the granular level and become a student at our Institute for Advanced Montessori Studies as the headmistress of the Henson Valley Montessori School, of how she took that school with some incredibly talented teachers, some incredibly talented but challenging parents, and created love and harmony and community. Val has gone on and run two non-Montessori schools, one of which is one of the leading independent schools of the greater Washington area, National Child Research Center. She also ran in between the Harbor School in Bethesda, Maryland. I've watched Val go on during her Montessori training and earn her first graduate degree, an MAT from Trinity, and then go on to earn her doctorate in educational leadership from George Washington University. Today, Val is going full circle. We had a conversation last year. One more school, professorship, deanship, how do I best use the years ahead? And Val is doing amazing things, transformative work as a consultant, as a speaker, as a builder of teams to confront challenging issues and to transform schools into places that are not only more inclusive, but more vibrant, more alive, more kind and gentle and honoring of all people in the school. Val is one of the leading educational leaders of the greater Washington, D.C. area. She has served on any number of boards, including my alma mater, the Barry School, um, has been a board member of the Monastery Foundation. We are in love with Val Weiss. You are going to be in love with Val Weiss. And I hope you'll have the opportunity not only to get to know her here, but that you'll have the opportunity to seek her services at your school. If you're ready to have some really creative, crucial conversation, this is one of the best. I'd like to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Val Ladia Weiss. I will give you a hug. I got a little teary on that one, right? <laughs> oh, I love that man. Um, so I'm honored to be here today. This is truly a remarkable conference. I had been told it was remarkable, but the love and genuineness and the sense of peace and place that this place has, it's really transformative. So let me just start by talking about my relationship with Montessori. My relationship with Montessori goes back almost 30 years, as you can tell. And in fact, Tim was very kind to me because he forgot to tell you one little story, that um, when he was interviewing me for being a student at the Barry School, and he used to say that I was a bit talkative, <laughs> so I will just say that I didn't get into the Barry School at that point. But that's actually, and I was four, but no, no I'm kidding. <laughs> But it started me on a path. I began, as so many moms do, I was looking for the perfect preschool for my son. I wanted what I had called a magical education for him. And I remember walking into my first Montessori classroom thinking, now this is what magic is all about. I enrolled him immediately. And when the school offered me an opportunity to be sponsored for Montessori training, I jumped at the chance. And I've never looked back. It has been a love affair that I've cherished for more years than I can count. 
So let's fast forward to several years. And my experience, as Tim has said, is run the gamut. I've been a primary guide. I was trained by Tim Selden, where I fell in love with the Montessori um, philosophy and the pedagogy, head of school of three different schools, and now a college professor and a consultant. I'm currently on the faculty of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and I teach diversity and inclusion to students seeking master's degrees in education. So research is a passion for me. And if you just let me geek out for a minute, I, I have to do this. Don't fall asleep. I'm a qualitative researcher. And I'm a standpoint feminist, theorist. And before you think I'm burning my bra or I'm running around saying I hate men, let me explain what that really means. And don't glaze over. It means that I believe in the power of story that individuals and those in marginalized, underrepresented groups have something to say that adds to the fabric of knowledge. I believe that there's knowledge and power in those stories. And in the field of social science, I do something that's called phenomenology. And it's not feeling heads or looking for bumps or anything like that. It's an approach to qualitative research that focuses on the commonality of the lived experience. Dr. Ecker talked about the lived experience last night if you were here and especially with particular groups. So through the process, what we, what we try to do is construct a universal meaning from events or situations or from phenomena and understanding that phenomena. So after years of being in and around a wide variety of schools, I began to notice some commonalities in the stories I was hearing, particularly from our families of color in Montessori. Families would come to me with the same questions and concerns, thoughts and musings, so as any dedicated qualitative researcher, I got curious. And I began to document the things that I was hearing. So over the past year, myself and the dean of the assistant dean of education at Johns Hopkins have been conducting focus groups. In fact, we've done 15 focus groups on the Eastern Seaboard with eight to 10 people in each one of them, up and down from um, as far as New England all the way down to North Carolina. And while my research is nowhere near finished, in fact, if any of you are interested in doing some of this research with me, I'd love it, themes are beginning to present themselves. And I'm gonna share some of those with you this afternoon. But before I dive into the research, we need to set the stage by talking about the world landscape. If it seems to you that there is so much volatility in the world around race, you would be right. There are lots of markers that demonstrate that this is a change that we had not prepared for. One of the demographic changes is here on this slide. This is a year when white majority becomes the minority. And if you'll notice, on that first slide, age under 18, in other words, students or children under the age of 18, whites are now the minority. As of 2017, kindergarten was majority minority. It changes the landscape about how we think about the United States and who we serve. And then if you look, by 2027, whites will become the minority in age 18 to 29. By 2085, minority by 30, for 30 to, 30 to 44. By 2061, 45 to 64. And then the complete flip, where whites are completely the minority by 2060. Sorry, you can't see the top of it, but it says racial hate crimes against children on the rise. So while the demographics of the United States have changed dramatically, hate crimes in the United States have also risen dramatically, but not just for everyone, specifically for children. If you'll notice, in 2015 through 16, it was a little more than 8,000. By 2017, 18, it's now to 10,000. And these are just the ones that are reported. There has been a demographic shift. There's a change in the way that we look at race in the United States. We need to think about these things. Hate crimes against children. So 81% of juvenile victims of hate crimes were ages 12 to 17. So children in your own school are more than likely having some hate crime against them. 63% of hate crimes against juveniles involved violent assaults, simple and aggravated assault, compared to only 39% of hate crimes against adults. And another sobering statistic, a fifth or 21% of hate crimes 
against juveniles occur at school, while only a tenth of all other types of crimes against juveniles occur there. The world has changed. And this last one. This is from Pew Charitable Trust. And the, the research that they asked, the research question they asked was, what's the percentage since Trump was elected? It has become blank for people to express racist or racially insensitive views. Almost as common, more common, less common. The respondent said 65% more common. In the next start of the part of the slide, it says, it has become blank for people to express racist or racially insensitive views. About as acceptable, more acceptable, or less acceptable, 45% said more acceptable. So with this in mind, there are things that we need to be thinking about that help us to frame this. What does this mean for us today? So by a variety of measures, it's pretty obvious that we're in a highly disruptive period. Last night, Dr. Ackers did such a beautiful job in likening this period of time to a kind of restructuring at a cellular level, where the cell is being reformed by outside forces and at times inside forces. Change is on the horizon, and this big shift in demographics has helped to fan this volatility. Montessori schools are in a unique position to lead the nation in issues of equity and inclusion, not just for our children, and our teachers, but for our families as well. But placing equity at the center of our practice is more than just making sure that communities are diverse. It also means that we're working for change that will prepare our organizations for families of color, the same way we think about preparing the classroom environment for the children who will inhabit them. We as a community have an opportunity to really do bold things at a time when education is imperiled. So given all these massive changes in our world and the place that school now provides for our families of color, I was interested in their experiences in our schools. So I grounded my research in feminist theory because I was interested in a specific underrepresented group. But I also grounded my research in something called critical race theory, CRT, because I was specifically interested in the impact of race or as a social construct and analyzing that through this lens. And it recognizes that while race may or may not be a consideration in the lives of those in the dominant culture, for people of color, and specifically African Americans, it's always present. In fact, notice what Pew Charitable Trust says about them. Most blacks say someone has acted suspicious of them or as if they weren't smart. And that is, of all the racial groups they looked at, African Americans were the ones who were consistently feeling that there was a pressure within their society that made them feel less than. These are relevant things. So I asked the question, what is the lived experience of families of color in Montessori schools? I used focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews with over 80 families of color in the Northeast Quadrant. And for several hours, families shared their experiences, told me their stories. My first question to them was always, tell me about your experiences growing up as a person of color. We call that background knowledge, and it helps to draw the group together. But something remarkable happened when I asked them to tell their story. Let's hear from them now. now the names and images, I pull the images off the internet because you can't know who these people are. That's part of our research. We can't do that. And I've changed their identities as well. Oh, I'm sorry. One important slide. So in terms of this, what's happening in our demographic and with this planet, it's demographic change, aging population, change in family structures, volatility around race, social political polarization, all of that is changing who we are. And then one of the things that's kind of interesting to talk about too from this Pew Charitable Trust is that blacks are more likely than other groups to see their ethnicity as central to their identity. It's something for us to remember as we go back into our communities that for African Americans specifically, who they are as African Americans is important. All right, so here's my question. What's the lived experience of families of color in our school environment? Let's meet Angela. This is Angela, her husband John, and their daughter Sia. Angela identifies as biracial. 
Angela says, I identified as being African American. I identified also as being Jewish because I also went to temple, but I definitely identified very early. I knew what I was, no matter how light I was. Like, I knew what I was. When I was in third grade, my teacher said in front of the entire class, I was an abomination. The teachers always singled me out in a way that um, they were letting the kids know that I was other. And there, there were a few different experiences, but that one really sticks out in my mind, of course, because I remember it like it was yesterday. Wow. So obviously, it still leaves a mark. Now, what's interesting about Angela is that she was not the only one. I think you'll see that although I only pulled out five people, they are representative of the 80. This is Kim and her daughter Amara. Kim identifies as African American. Kim says, early on, I remember we had one of those multicultural days and the teacher saying, you look like you could be from Kenya and just sort of like attaching an identity to me. Um, where my colleagues, my, my classmates were all saying, you know, I have a parent who's British or Irish, what have you. And so early on, understanding that there was something very specific about my identification, um, that I just couldn't, I couldn't identify a country of origin. So I think early on, I just kind of understood and embraced big African American because I didn't know where else, what else I was. This is Wynette. Wynette identifies as black and of mixed Caribbean heritage. It's an experience that my husband had as a college student. It's the experience that he had that first opened my eyes to this, that this is serious stuff, that you know, um, people talk about, that African Americans talk about, this is real. So he was simply returning to his dorm after a day of being um, out in the classes and, and whatever, and you know, he just, he walks into his dorm and a white girl walks in ahead of him he walks in and you know, he's going to his mailbox, checking his mail, and all of a sudden there's a, like a whole bunch of police. She goes on to tell the story that the girl who was in front of him thought he didn't belong, and he didn't realize that the police were for him until they started asking for his identification. This is Jessie. Jessie's the young woman on the right. She has two daughters. And Jessie and her husband identify as Indian American and Sikhs. Okay, so anyway, I was saying that I was in first grade in Asheboro, North Carolina. And um, the way that the school was set up in that city actually was like this. And it, it, by me, it was a dry county town where I grew up. Wow. Um, was, it was self-segregated by race socially. And so you could see it everywhere in the town, but definitely at school. And I remember we had broken for recess, and um, the kids separated, and it was, you know, all the, the black girls were playing together, and all the white girls were playing together, and I didn't know where to go. I couldn't, nobody told me what I was, except Indian. And um, I didn't know where to go, and I actually was friends with this girl, Faye, who was black, and I started walking towards her, and I seemed confused, and they said, they said, Jesse, are you black or are you white? I didn't know the answer to that question. This is Trey. He identifies as African American. He's married to a white woman and has one son. I was born in Ghana, came to the United States briefly and returned to Ghana, was in England for a while because of visa trouble. And, um, and then we ended up in upstate New York, central New York. Our family was the only black African American family in the village and it took a lot. Um, I think, I, like, I've, I remember telling my mother that I felt like I was an alien like that. I didn't have a lot in common with any, with any of the peers, really. We didn't listen to the same music. We didn't appreciate the same things. Um, so it took a lot. And pretty much all growing up, we were the only black family. Now, these are just five of over 80 families I've interviewed, but they're representative of the sample. If we could have a mic, please. And we're gonna play Phil Donahue. That's what Blake told me. <laughs> okay. 
Vanna White, thank you, Vanna. Appreciate it. Have you noticed anything, any commonalities in these representative samples? What did you notice? Yes, right up here. Can you hold on for one second? Sorry. I love hearing your voice. <laughs> they were confused about their identities. They were confused about their identities. What else did you hear? Yes, right here. Can we flip to here and I'll get you next. Right there. Keep your hand up, won't you? And it got you over there. Their identities were attached to some external feature. Their identities were attached sure. to an external feature. Thanks. And there's one person over there and then you. Sorry to make you run all over. That um, the experience stayed with them for life. The experience stayed with them for life. And over here in the corner. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm biracial, so I had the same problem. People, you know, growing up say, well, are you white or are you black? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm human, I'm me. But I had the same problem, you know, listening to the same challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. Experience it. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Yes, right over here. So and there's the woman in the red and then the woman in the floral. I noticed the need for other people to put people neatly into boxes. Ah, putting people neatly into boxes. And they all felt that that was not a good thing. It was like if they were not good enough because of that difference. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the, there's several. Thank you. And I love my two mics. Blake, you're a doll. Thank you. They all question where they belong. They question where they belong. They were feel confused, discriminated, and different. Yeah, confused, discriminated against, and different. Oh, right over here at this table. These are all great. I noticed that even if it was male or female, they were probably around the age group of between 20 and 30. They weren't very old. That's right. They were, they were young. That's, they were pretty young. Yes. And the, the floral right here. Raise your hand high. There we got you. Thank you. I was just going to say that I noticed that really none of them had thought about their race until the outside person put a judgment on them. Isn't that interesting? So one of the things we've noticed about this, and hold on, Blake and, and company, just hold on one second. Don't go too far. One of the things you, you brought up in your conversation was that there was some, some trauma that they have experienced around the issue of race and that it stayed with them. So then let me ask you another question. What does that do for them as they raise their children? How does that lens affect what they're thinking about with their own children, do you think? There's a one up here and one back there. Um, I had a similar experience in first grade. So of course, uh, me being a mother, mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to protect them from or have them be aware that those kind of things could happen. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to kind of arm them mm -hmm. for what could happen in there. Thank you for that. For That's what I was going to say, too, yes. is that they would want to protect them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. And there's one up here. Um, you're adding that lens to your child, even though they wouldn't have necessarily had it. You're giving that lens to your child that this is how people see you and this is how you'll perceive the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's almost like an implicit bias, isn't it? That they come with that baggage. Other thoughts? Right there. Well, you know, I had a different experience in that I was the little kid with glasses and freckles, and I was called four eyes for years. And so that sense of being different and being less than is not only racial. It's just mm -hmm. sometimes the cruelty of children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So 
after looking at the data, and several things began to become apparent for me, and I was looking at families. This, families want strong academics. They want their children to benefit from the dynamic Montessori pedagogy that supports independence, curiosity, creativity, all the things that we know are powerful in the Montessori sphere. But they're also looking for other things that are very specific and unique to people of color. And I will share three areas that have kind of written, risen to the top. And remember, this research is, is still nascent. It's still fresh. So this will take me still a few, to, eh, probably another year, to completely get through it. But there's some interesting things that came out of this research. Three things. A sense of psychological safety, a sense of belonging, and moving from colorblind to color brave. Now when you see this, you'll think that everybody wants psychological safety. Everybody has had bullying or something. But imagine we've all had bullying. We may have all had the, the, the child on the, on the playground who called us the name. But these are layered on top of that. So there's a commonality in the experience. But add to that the weight of race. It is unique and different. Because yes, we have that experience of bullying. But unless you're a person of color, you don't have the other piece. And that's the power of this. So, and appreciating that opens us up to such a wide range of experiences and understanding how people fit in. And then everybody benefits because we're looking at people as individuals, families as individuals. And we're understanding who they are from what I, do, like, what I love now and borrowing all the time from a cellular level. So let's look at this a sense of psychological safety. This is what Wynette said. The idea of raising black boys in the US totally freaks me out, um, like completely. I know that they will have a very different experience to what um, you know, I have. I have three older brothers. They will have a different experience than my brothers had in Trinidad, as with my husband had growing up. I need a place for them that is racially safe. So when asked, what can your school provide, she offered, I need a place for them that is racially safe. We talk about bullying and we want them to be safe with that, but have we thought about what it means for them to be racially safe? And this is what Angela said when asked the same question. Um, but I didn't want her to be in an environment where she had to feel like she was other. I wanted her to be in an environment where she felt like she could be herself, 100% herself, in every way possible, and that she can develop into the person that she's meant to be without having the fear of um, showing who she is to anyone. The experiences that I had had made me want to give Montessori to my child. Her desire was what the gift that Montessori can give, that we can become the place where people can be all their authentic selves, where they can see themselves reflected, not just in the books that we read and the posters, but in the people who are working with them, in the ideology and the pedagogy that is surrounding them. giving them a sense of belonging. We all want to belong. That's one of the fundamental needs of man, right? We need to belong to someone or something. We need to be part of a group. And Trey put it lovely. He said, I don't know what he'll be like talking about his son's effort growing up. You know, my experience is not his. It won't be his. He has a white mother. Um, and it'll be different than mine. And I desperately want him to feel like he belongs, for him to see himself and have a strong identity. That's what I hope the school and can part and can support. And here is the gauntlet that's thrown down. For many of us, we talk about the fact that we want to be colorblind, that children don't see color, or we don't see color. Well, we know from the research that children actually do see color. They see color as early as six months old. Um, what they don't do is they don't attribute a value to that color, but they understand difference. And unless adults help them understand and perceive it, the rest of the world will tell them how the value of culture is and the value of what their color is. And that's what we need to be fighting against. So moving from colorblind to color brave, we're asking to help them be prepared. So this is what this, the thought is from this one. 
It was probably the second month in primary for my son. I was there at the school, and the teacher kept calling my son the name of the other Chinese boy in the class, two or three times. And the first time, I was like, I'm just going to let it go. But then I had to say something. But I thought, I will have him say something. I didn't say it. I was like, Yen, tell him who you are. I wanted him to know that being called whatever, whoever's name all of his life, even though, no, that's not you, is not right. But I told him, because I was like, that teacher should know you can't be calling every Asian boy you see whatever name you decide to choose, right? And so, yeah, maybe that was my baggage. But I want him to educate that teacher, and I don't want to be the one who's saying, saying it. I want him to know that it's coming from Yen. Dr. Acker talked about that, the importance of names, and making sure last night that we pronounce them, that we take the time, because name is identity. And especially for some cultures, names are specifically given to children because of the power of the name. And for us to say, well, you know what, I can't say that, or to dismiss it, it's better to try and mess up than not use their name at all, or give them another name. So the question is, Val, this is great, fine. How do we go about doing all of this? What are the steps? What should we be doing? Well, I went back to our, our, our focus groups, and I asked them that exact question. And they told me this. We need to give children and parents, and I would argue teachers and administrators and everyone else who's involved, language. Giving children the language so that when they are put in a position, a situation, what do you say? Right. And you just, by modeling it and not just by saying it once to somebody, even in a fake situation, then when the real situation comes to them, they are more apt to speak up or do the right thing. Just sort of saying it out loud, learning about the situation is good preparation. So giving children, giving adults, giving our community language that A, it's okay to talk about race, it's not scary, it is not negative. And in fact, the reason that we don't talk about it, then people think it's negative. It is, yes, it's a social construct, but isn't it glorious that we have come from so many different backgrounds? And I can bring to you the, the, the wonderfulness of the African American experience, and you can bring to me the wonderfulness of the Sikh experience, that the experience is the thing that makes our diverse community so powerful. If we talk about race, we will encompass and, and we will have the power of race. And that's what's going to help us be such a better organization. They're asking us to do our homework. And this is what the Voices from the Field says. My husband is African American. And the struggle that I have, and this is great that we're having this conversation because I've been really stewing about this um, a lot. I guess is the dominant narrative that's told about African Americans tends to be very oppressive based on oppression adjacent. I did my research, reached out to all my publisher friends, and I said, listen, I need a list of books where, where the problem, the protagonist in it is a black person. It's, it's, you know, not being murdered. They're not have their selves in chains or oppressed. I just want a good storyline about black people. I don't care if it's sci-fi, I just need it and I was able to come up with 20 titles. I want my school to understand that the narrative needs to be balanced. I want them to do their homework too. When we look at our work, what do our books say? What are the movies that we're watching? Are we thinking about it with a different lens? And I would argue a critical race lens, a feminist lens. Are we thinking about it in the way that everyone in the room sees themselves reflected in what's called windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors? Provide safe spaces to talk about race and its impact. Sometimes I feel as if I don't have a voice at the school. I realize that in Montessori we are supposed to observe and not be an impact on the classroom, but I don't know if there's a place for me to talk about the things we've talked about today. I feel like we need that space, that it's okay to talk about race and its impact. So giving families of color a venue and yes, sometimes it's totally appropriate and so refreshing to be able to speak Spanish with the folks who you know speak Spanish and understand your culture. It is not that we're trying to be away from you. 
What we're asking is to be able to be centered in a space where we can talk about these things. That there's a group where families of color can talk. We can come together too. But a group where Asian Americans can talk about their experience, where Sikh Americans can talk about their experience, and they feel heard. So what's the takeaway so far? That families of color may be coming with significant racial trauma that must be acknowledged. That they are absolutely looking for Montessori education to provide what, is famous, what it's famous for, but they're also asking for more that it support the idea of belonging, psychological safety, and to be brave when it comes to issues of race, to discuss it openly and not succumb to the narrative of a single story, that being colorblind is not supportive of families. They're asking us to be color brave. But ultimately, let me end with some words from Paolo Freire, one of my favorite authors next to Dr. Montessori in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. One cannot expect positive results from an educational or political action program which fails to respect the particular view of the world held by the people in it. My challenge is to open up our worldview so that we hear everyone's voice, that we look at our policies and our procedures with a racial equity lens and decide, is everyone at the table represented in this? How does it impact them? Have we heard their voices? Thank you for this time today. It has been my honor and pleasure. You have been a phenomenal audience, and I'm hoping that I didn't put you to sleep with my research. <laughs>
and helping people understand that this is what we're going to do and putting it in the sand, saying this is our statement. Um, the Montessori Public Policy Initiative, who's Wendy's right here, if you want to ask her about it, has done a powerful mission statement about equity. It is probably one of the most forward thinking that I've seen in a long time. You might want to check that one out as well. Thank you for that question. Thank you. And is it possible to maybe share some of these resources that have been laid out? Yes, they will bother me and let me do it because you know Margot's like on, she's on me. So she, <laughs> yes, I will do that. I'm happy to do that. Other questions? Right here. Ah, yes. I, I would just like to know, is there going to be something that we could take back? <laughs> with, um, yes. Like a recording, audio or oh, something? Oh, an audio recording. I, good question. That's what they do? This is... He's going to talk about that in a moment. And also, if you guys keep, if you don't mind bugging me about it because it helps me, we're, we're going to be writing this. This will be a book to talk about because I, one of the things we found is that families of color want to be able to talk to their, their children of color about these issues. And so that will be the culmination of all of this work as well at some point. In the back there. Ahlan was silent. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's a question, but I noticed that in this country, uh, people divide uh, races in five races, hmm. and I always say, oh, so I do not fit in any of this race. So I think it's like kind of weird to just limit it at five. Yeah, right. So I just Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's time to change this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and I get to use my little bit of my Arabic with her, so that's always fun. Um, <laughs> One of the things you're seeing in Montessori schools in particular is that when we gather racial data, we're now asking you just report, how do you see yourself? And in fact, you look at some now people's signatures and they not only talk about who they are, I see myself as an African-American female and my pronouns are um, she, her, hers. So we're really looking at how to individualize that process and instead of saying, you need to choose, in fact, tell us who you are. And if I think if there's anything I'm hoping that we really gain from this is how important it is for us to know who is in our community and to have those conversations. There used to be a time, we talk about this, Tim and I, all the time, when Montessori teachers went to everybody's home. And it's hard to do now just because of the world, but what a magical time that was because you really got to learn who they were and find out, you know what? They eat injera at this house because they're Ethiopian. Who do? You know? But you don't know those things until you go into the house and you learn about it. So find a way to gather that data so that you can honor the various people who are in your community, and sometimes you'll be surprised. Okay, so again, thank you. It has been phenomenal. I've appreciated this so much, and it's added so much to my own personal experience. Take good care, and please continue to do powerful work for Montessori. <laughs>